So let's set the recording and let's talk a little bit about chemical equations. So chemical equations. So we, as a review of the fundamental rules of chemical equations, the number of atoms of each element before and after a reaction does not change, okay? Now, as a consequence of this fact, we also know that because the number of atoms of each, each element does not change, we also know that the total mass does not change during a reaction. Atoms are conserved, ergo mass is conserved. So, Let's take a look at a practical example of conservation of mass at a macro scale. So let's zoom in a little bit just so that we can see that. So we have the reaction between silver and sulfur to make silver sulfide. So we have two moles of silver. So this is a representation for the number of atoms of silver. We have one mole of sulfur reacting to yield one mole of silver sulfide. If we add up, if we add up the mass of silver plus the mass of sulfur, we get 247.9 grams for our reactant. And as we see at the end of our reaction, we would isolate an identical mass total of products. So in this case, we put in 247.9 grams, we get out 247.9 grams. However, even though we have not changed our total mass, this 247.9 grams, this is grams of silver sulfide. So we've modified the chemical identity of our mass. Okay, so mass is conserved in chemical reactions. We've used this principle time and time again. Now let's, let's focus on a micro scale reaction. Let's focus on a micro scale reaction. So for example, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas reacting to produce water. Now my question to all of you is, how many total atoms of hydrogen do we have reacting on the left? And you can type in chat at this time. How many atoms of hydrogen do we have reacting on the left? Yep, four. So we have four hydrogen atoms. Okay, and these four hydrogen atoms have a mass of about four AMU. Okay, how many oxygen atoms do we have reacting on the left-hand side? How many oxygen atoms? Two, yep. And that gives us approximately 16 times two, which is approximately 32 AMU. So we have about 36 AMU of reactant. Now on the right hand side we see we have four hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms. So we have four AMU plus 32 AMU which gives us a mass of product of 36 AMU. So we can see even at a molecular level mass is conserved throughout chemical reactions. Okay, so let's keep going, let's keep going now. So for chemical equations, so chemical equations, so let's take a look for example. So let's do just a basic chemical equation. So sulfuric acid reacting with hydrochloric, oh, oh sulfuric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide aqueous to give us sodium sulfate and water. Okay, so chemical equations indicate the number of each reactant molecule consumed by a chemical reaction and the number of each product molecule produced. Okay, so let's, 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 try, to, let's try to showcase this fact. So looking at this equation, how many molecules of sulfuric acid are reacting? How many molecules of sulfuric acid are reacting? One, exactly right. So we have one molecule 
of H2SO4. And we get that just by reading our reaction coefficient. How many molecules of NaOH, sodium hydroxide, are reacting? How many molecules of sodium hydroxide are reacting? Two, exactly. Okay, and in turn, on our product side, we make one mole of sodium sulfate and two moles of water. Okay, so by reading off our reaction coefficients, we can determine the number of each reactant molecule consumed and the number of product molecules produced. Okay, so in terms of mole ratios in chemistry, we're quite familiar with the idea of an element or ion mole ratio. So for example, N2O5. My question to all of you is, how many moles of nitrogen do we have per how many moles of oxygen in N2O5? What is our mole to mole ratio? So let's start by, yep, two fifths, exactly. So we have two moles of nitrogen for every five moles of oxygen. So we obtain this from our subscripts. So this in effect is a mole ratio that relates the moles of nitrogen to the moles of oxygen in our compounds. This is in N2O5. We can also generate what's known as a stoichiometric mole ratio, and this is within a chemical reaction. So for example, reading the following chemical reaction, I'd like you to tell me how many moles of water are reacting. How many moles of water do we have that are reacting? How many moles of water are reacting? Yep. Okay. Okay. And now, how many moles of P4O10 are all are reacting with that water? How many moles of P4O10 do we have? One, exactly right. So this is a mole ratio in a chemical reaction. So what this is saying is for a complete reaction, we need six moles of water to react with every one mole of uh, tetraphosphor tetraphosphorus deca oxide. We can also do a relationship between reactants and products. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. How many moles of H3PO4, how many moles of phosphoric acid are we making? How many moles of phosphoric acid are we making? Four, exactly right. And in order to make those four moles of phosphoric acid, how many moles of water do we need to react? How many moles of water do we need to use up? Six, exactly. So four moles of phosphoric acid are made for six moles of water. So we can do a ratio between reactants and reactants. And we can also establish a relationship between our products and our reactants. Okay, perfect. So by reading off, and here's the key thing, fundamentally we are reading our coefficients. So these are our coefficients from our chemical equation. That's what we're reading off to generate our stoichiometric mole ratio. Okay, so let's keep going. Now, a chemical equation provides a relationship between the number of reactant and product molecules. So for example, if we're interpreting the following equation, so nitrogen and hydrogen gas react to yield ammonia, let's list all of the mole ratios we can generate. Okay, so let's start with hydrogen. So for 
how many moles of hydrogen do we have reacting? How many moles of hydrogen do we have reacting in this formula? How many moles of hydrogen do we have? Uh, not hydrogen atoms, just hydrogen molecules. So what's the coefficient for hydrogen? Three, yep. So we have three moles of H2. Um, just as a side note, when we mention element names, when we're talking about chemical reactions, we're referring to the moles of the molecular species, if a molecular species is available. So we have three moles of H2, okay? And let's first do a reactant-reactant ratio. So for every, we need three moles of hydrogen to react with how many moles of nitrogen? We need three moles of hydrogen to react with how many moles of nitrogen? One, okay. So essentially what we're saying, we need three moles of hydrogen is needed to react with one mole of nitrogen. So that's what a reactant to reactant ratio represents. It's the amount needed to completely react with your other reactant. Okay, let's do a product ratio. So we need three moles of hydrogen, and when that reacts, we make how many moles of ammonia? How many moles of ammonia do we make from this reaction? And don't be shy to type in chat. I see a lot of twos, exactly right. So what this is saying, in terms of the way that we have this ratio, three moles of H2 is needed to produce two moles of ammonia. Wonderful, okay. So let's make some other mole ratios. Let's make some other mole ratios. So this time let's start with nitrogen on top. Let's start with nitrogen on top. So we, we know that we have one mole of nitrogen, one mole of nitrogen. And let's try to answer the question. Let's do a reactant to reactant ratio. So for one mole of nitrogen, we, meet, we need one mole of nitrogen to completely react with how many moles of hydrogen? One mole of nitrogen completely reacts with how many moles of hydrogen? How many moles of hydrogen are present in our reaction? Three, exactly right. And likewise, likewise, one mole of nitrogen when it reacts makes how many moles of ammonia? How many moles of ammonia do we make? Two, exactly right. And of course, of course, just to keep in mind, can we flip these ratios? Can I take this ratio and invert it? Can I just as easily say we make two moles of ammonia for every one mole of nitrogen? Yeah. So we, we can invert these ratios. These are going to be our fundamental conversion factors that we use throughout this course when describing chemical reactions. So what I want us now to do is using that as an example, I'd like you to fill in, I'd like you to fill in the following mole ratios. So first, we want to say how many moles of CO2 are produced per how many moles of O2. For B, I'd like you to write the, write the ratio describing the moles of O2 needed to react with carbon monoxide. So I'd like you to work on trying to write the following ratios and we'll come together to discuss in a few minutes. And you're welcome to send me your ratios. And I'll be checking your work periodically. And Francisco, your answer is perfectly correct. And don't be shy to send me a message. Uh, uh, Roberto, for, for which answer prompt are you referring to, A or B? Uh, 
uh, I would I would check the the coefficients one more time. Mario, that's exactly correct for A. That's exactly right for A. Yep, perfect. You're just reading off from your coefficients. So I see a lot of reasonable responses for A. So let's talk a little bit about this. How many moles of CO2 do we have produced in this reaction? How many moles of CO2 do we have produced? Two. Okay. And how many moles of oxygen gas have we consumed? One, exactly right. So it's a two to one ratio. Two moles of CO2 are produced per every one mole of oxygen that reacts. So let's think about this relationship. We, we wanna calculate the moles of O2 needed to react with CO2. So then what is gonna be on top, CO2 or O2? If we wanna describe the moles of O2 needed to react, what's gonna go on top? So we wanna know the moles of O2 needed to react. So if we look at our phrasing, so we have the needed to produce, essentially we put, if we're trying to figure out the moles of O2 needed to react, we put the moles of O2 on top. Cause that's, we're always trying to calculate the number on top of our ratio. Okay, and how many moles of O2 do we have reacting? How many moles of O2 do we have reacting? One, exactly right. And how many moles of carbon monoxide are reacting in this reaction? How many moles of carbon monoxide are reacting? Yep, I see two. Yep, that's exactly right. So we need one mole of oxygen to react with two moles of CO2. So if we're filling in the blanks here, our chemical equation is telling us we have one mole of oxygen needed to react with two moles of CO2. Does that make sense to everyone? The process of creating stoichiometric coefficients? This is really critical towards problem solving in chemical equations and tackling stoichiometry. Any questions? Don't be shy to ask. If not, let's try to apply this a little more rigorously. And let's talk a little bit about some really important principles in chemical reaction. So I like to call this the principle of scalability. Chemical reactions occur at a molecular level, but the same reaction is essentially occurring a very large number of times. For example, if you put a penny into a penny press, you'll get one of these commemorative pressed pennies. That's wonderful. That's essentially, this is essentially describing our atomic scale. We're taking one particle and transforming it into a new, a new molecular species. Okay, wonderful. If we take a thousand pennies, a hundred pennies, a mole of pennies, a mole of pennies will still give us one mole of pressed pennies. So the whole point of this discussion, the whole, the whole point of this example is that if you repeat a reaction for one mole of material, you get moles of product based on the reaction coefficient and the react, reaction mole ratio. So in this case, we're studying the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen to yield water. Okay. So pictorially, pictorially, we see that if we take two dozen molecules of hydrogen and one dozen molecules of oxygen, we get two dozen molecules of water. Now, fundamentally, fundamentally, what is our baseline mole ratio? So let's suppose we start with two dozen. So let's say two dozen. H2 molecules. My question to all of you is, reading from our reaction equation, how many molecules of water do we make 
per molecule of hydrogen that we react. How many molecules of water are we making from our stoichiometry? And don't be shy to type in chat. Yep, two. We're making two molecules of water. And how many molecules of hydrogen are reacting? How many molecules of hydrogen are reacting? Two, exactly right. So then, in the end, we have a two to two ratio. So we get out two dozen H2O molecules. So fundamentally, no matter how many molecules of reactant you have, no matter what your initial reactant amounts are, the amount of product is determined by your stoichiometry. Does that make sense to everyone? Does everyone notice how this two dozen, one dozen, and two dozen correspond to our coefficients of two, one, and two? So the mole ratio determines the ratio of moles of reactant to reactant and product to reactant, no matter how much material we are reacting. And that's the beauty of chemical reactions, that they're scalable. And by utilizing the chemical equation, you can calculate the amount of product produced for any scale of reaction. Okay, so let's, let's, let's do some additional analogies here. So the ratio of reactant molecules consumed and product molecules produced in a chemical reaction is constant and depends on the chemical reaction coefficients. We can examine reactions involving any number of molecules or moles of molecules and the reaction mole ratio is constant. The chemical equation provides us the mole ratio of reactants to products. And the chemical equation also gives us a relationship between the moles of reactants and other reactants. So the chemical equation really is our key to solving stoichiometry problems. So to talk a little bit about stoichiometry. So we're very familiar with, and just to, just to remind everyone, we're very familiar with doing mass mole conversions and mole to particle conversions. We even know how to handle solutions from previous chapters. Now, the main thing that stoichiometry introduces is it allows us to go from moles of known sample to moles of reactant or the moles of product. And to do that, our conversion factor in this case is our stoichiometric ratio. So from our stoichiometric ratio, we can convert from our moles of, of starting material, be it reactant or product, and convert to any other species in our chemical equation. So we need a balanced equation for this process. That's where we get our stoichiometric ratio. So to give us a little bit of a guide on how to tackle stoichiometry problems, first and foremost, you need to balance the chemical equation. This is really key. If you don't have a balanced equation, you're just stuck. Next, you're gonna identify your starting units. So whatever your starting units are, you identify them and you identify your final desired units. Now, if we wanna go between mass and moles, we use our molar mass, okay? So from grams to moles, if we wanna go from grams to moles, we divide by our molar mass. To go from moles to grams, we multiply by our molar mass. Now, this is review from chapter four. To convert between atoms and molecules to moles, we use Avogadro's number. So from moles to particles, you multiply by Avogadro's number. If we're going the opposite direction from particles to moles, we'll divide by Avogadro's number. 
we're just filling in our, our conversion map. Now, the new addition, the new addition and one that we'll need to focus on to convert between moles of molecules and moles of atoms of an element in that molecule, you use your chemical formula mole ratio. So let's give an example of that. So suppose we're looking at N2H4. If we wanna go from moles of, of our molecule, the moles of our atom, we are going to use, in this case, we're dealing with a formula. And as a result, we're going to use our formula ratio. So for example, if we wanted to go from moles of N2H4 to moles of nitrogen, we'd say we have two moles of nitrogen for every one mole of N2H4. So this is an example of a formula ratio. Does this look like review to everyone? This, these are things that we've seen before that I'm just refreshing because we'll use them in this chapter. Is everyone comfortable so far? Can I get some feedback? that, okay. Okay, perfect. So now we're gonna build on this and we're gonna talk about what happens now that we have the moles. So we want the moles, okay? And ideally moles of a reactant or product. Okay, so now that we have the moles of reactants or products, to convert between the moles of reactants and the moles of another reactant, use the chemical equation mole ratio. So fundamentally, anytime you're going from moles to moles as part of your chemical equation, you're going to use your equation mole ratio. Likewise, we can also go from moles of reactant to moles of product, and you can also go from moles of product to moles of another product. So your equation mole ratio is really a multi-purpose tool that you're gonna need to put together from the chemical equation to deal with any unit conversion that involves species in your chemical reaction, okay? Now, one thing that I really want you to develop as a habit, especially in this chapter, is I want you to write out the individual unit converg conversions needed to convert from your starting units to your desired units. So just like before, I want you to write them out step by step. So for example, grams to moles of reactant to moles of product to grams of product, et cetera. So I, sure. So just like before, stoichiometry involves unit conversion. So as a result, if you generate these unit conversion maps, it'll save you a lot of grief in completing these stoichiometry problems. So this is a, just a problem solving manifold. Let's now focus on applying this manifold in order to tackle stoichiometry. So for example, looking at the following case, given the following equation, so we have carbon monoxide and oxygen reacting to give CO2. We're being asked how many moles of O2 gas are required to completely react with five moles of carbon monoxide. So what's our first step? What's our first step before we do anything else involving our chemical equation? What's the first step that we're gonna do? Yep. So the first step we're gonna do is we're gonna balance our equation. 
So I'll give everyone a few minutes to work through balancing the following equation. And I'd like you just to tell me the coefficients for carbon monoxide, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. So A, B, and C. So take about a minute to two minutes to balance this equation. In fact, we've seen this equation previously as well. But take a few moments and you're welcome to message me questions or um, send me your answers using the chat. So take a few moments to balance the equation. And you're welcome to send me the coefficients using the chat. Yep, Francisco, that's exactly right. And we wanna make sure we're still comfortable balancing our chemical equation because otherwise we'll be sort of stuck. We can't really handle stoichiometry problems unless we have a balanced chemical equation. Marjorie, that's exact. Uh, I would double check your coefficient for O2. Yep, exactly right. So let's write out our balanced equation. So we have two Oops, one moment. So we have two carbon monoxide gas plus one O2 molecule reacts to yield two molecules of carbon dioxide gas. So now that we have our balanced equation, let's calculate the moles of O2 that are required to completely react with five moles of carbon monoxide. Okay, so what is our target? What units are we give? What units do we want to reach? What are we trying to calculate? The moles of what? Moles of O2, exactly right. So we're trying to calculate the moles of O2. Okay, because the question is asking how many moles of O2 are required, okay? And what are we given? What are we given? What are we given as a number? What starting number are we given? What quantity are we given? The moles of what? What are we starting with? Yep, exactly. So we're starting with five moles of carbon monoxide and we're trying to calculate the moles of oxygen. Okay, and now this is really cool. What we can do just like before, when we're doing unit conversions, we draw our arrow and we put what we're trying to reach on top. So what's gonna go on top of our unit conversion expression? If we start with five moles of CO, what units are gonna go on top? What are we trying to reach? What are we trying to calculate? What are we going to? What units are we going to? The moles of what? O2, exactly right. So we have, want to have a conversion factor of the form moles of O2. And then what units are we starting from? Where, where is our arrow going from? 
what units are we starting from that we want to get rid of? Yep, exactly. The moles of carbon monoxide. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to read off our mole to mole ratio from our chemical equation. So how many moles of O2 are reacting in our reaction? How many moles of O2 are reacting? One, exactly right. And how many moles of carbon monoxide are reacting? Two. Perfect. So then, if we check our units, the moles of carbon monoxide cancels. And in turn, that gives us 2.5 moles of O2. There we go. So we write out our starting units, we write out our target units, and then using unit analysis, we place our units in the correct position. We put what we want on top. We put what we have on the bottom. And we read off our mole to mole ratio from our chemical equation. Let's do, another, let's do another example using the same equation. We're asked how many moles of CO2 are produced by complete reaction of 3.5 moles of O2. Okay, so what are we trying to calculate? What are we trying to calculate? The moles of what? What are we trying to calculate? CO2, exactly right. We're trying to calculate the moles of CO2. And what are we starting out with? What, what are we starting off with? The moles of what? What are we given in the problem? Yep, exactly right. We're given the moles of O2. Oh, wow. <laughs> Some students are already calculating this. Um, okay, so first things first, we write our starting value. We're starting off with 3.5 moles of O2. Now, using unit analysis, we draw our arrow. So what units are gonna go on top? What units are we trying to reach? What are we trying to reach? What are we trying to calculate? Yep, exactly moles of CO2. So we're trying to calculate the moles of CO2. And what units are we starting from? What are we starting from? What's our starting point? What's our starting point in this case? What are we starting from? What units do we want to get rid of? What are we going to put on the bottom? O2, exactly right. Okay, now all we have to do is read off our stoichiometric coefficients. So how many moles of CO2 are we making? How many moles of CO2 are we making? How many moles of CO2 are produced in the chemical equation? Two, exactly right. Okay. And now my next follow-up question is how many moles of O2 are reacting in our chemical equation? How many moles of O2 are reacting? One, exactly right. So we cancel our moles of O2 and that gives us 7.0 moles of CO2. Does this logic make sense to everyone? Is everyone comfortable reading a balanced equation and using it to perform stoichiometry calculations? Let's make sure we're all on the same page and let's try an example. And if I'm going a little too fast on these examples, don't be shy to, to stop me. I'm, I'm more than willing to slow down if you let me know I'm going too fast. So what I want us to do now is I want us to take about three to four minutes and I'll set the timer up and I'd like you to tackle given the following equation. So I gave you a balanced chemical equation to make things a little bit easier and I'd like you to calculate the moles of H2 required to react with two moles of nitrogen and I'd like you to tell me the moles of ammonia that are produced by complete reaction of 1.5 moles of hydrogen. So take a few minutes and you can message me your answers for A and B.
and I will be more than willing to provide feedback. And don't be shy to send me questions if you're stuck or share your screen or um, turn on your webcam and show me, a pic show me your paper and I can take a look and provide feedback, whatever you're comfortable with. But let's take a few minutes, about three minutes, and let's work through these problems. And then of course, we'll come together as a group to discuss. Here all that answer looks looks good. It's perfect. Um, if possible, if you could message me um, your shared answers during these sessions as a private message, that would be perfect, but I'm more than willing to respond to any message I receive. But I guess the moles of hydrogen you calculate are, are perfectly correct. Yep, Joseph, for part A, your response is completely correct. And Joseph, for part B, let's see. Your response is completely correct. Alicia, your response for part A is completely correct. Perfect. And we'll spend about another a min minute and a half working through these problems. I really want to make sure you have some time to practice stoichiometry and we're going to slowly increase the problem difficulty. Uh, Mariana, the first response is completely correct and Haral, your response for part B is also correct. So we'll spend about another minute working through this problem. Mariano, your response for part B is also perfect. And Marjorie, for part A, you're completely correct. Uh, Victoria, the work that you've shown in the chat is also perfectly correct. And Marjorie, for part B, your answer is correct. Wonderful, I see a lot of good answers so far. So let's now talk through this problem. So for part A, we're asked to calculate the moles of H2. So what is our target? What is our target? What are we trying, what, what, what are we, what units are we trying to convert to? What are we trying to calculate fundamentally? And don't be shy to type in chat. Yep, exactly right. We're trying to calculate the moles of H2. And what are we starting with? What are we given in the problem? The moles of what? What are we given? Yep, exactly. So we're trying to go from two moles of N2 to the moles of H2. So just like before, we're going to write our starting units. And now we're going to draw our arrow. We're going to draw our arrow and we put what we're trying to get to on top. So what units go on top? What units go on top? Moles of H2, exactly right. And what units are we going from? What units are gonna be on the bottom? N2, exactly right. Okay, now we just read off our stoichiometric coefficients. So how many moles of H2 are reacting in our chemical equation? Three, exactly right. And how many moles of N2 are reacting in our chemical equation? One, exactly right. 
the moles of N2 cancel and we're left with six moles of H2. Perfect, so far so good. We're gonna do part B. Um, so our target this time is the moles of ammonia. And we're starting with 1.5 moles of H2. So I'm gonna write my starting units. And let's try to let's try to expedite our logic. Would someone like to tell me what quantity am I going to plug in on top? So looking at my chemical equation, what quantity am I going to plug in on top? Yep, two moles of NH3. Exactly right. Where did I get the two from? I got it from my chemical equation. The moles of NH3, because my conversion arrow, I'm converting to the moles of ammonia. Okay, and now what unit, what am I gonna put on the bottom? What quantity goes on the bottom? Yep, three moles of H2. Where did we get the three moles of H2 from? From our chemical equation. Okay, so from this setup, if we punch this into our calculator, we end up with one mole of NH3. And the key thing is, I'm always checking that my units cancel. So unit analysis is extremely powerful in stoichiometry as it allows you not only to check your work, but it allows you to design your conversion factors without necessarily understanding what a conversion factor fully means. Like just by looking at the units, we can set up our quantities and set up conversion factors. So our starting units cancel, and our desired units are obtained. That's really the power of unit analysis. Did this example make sense? Is everyone comfortable with the example? this example? Just wanna make sure that everyone's still following along and that if anyone has any questions that they aren't shy asking questions. Okay, so we're gonna add a little bit of complexity now to this problem. And given the following equation, we're asked how many grams of hydrogen sulfide are needed to completely react with 5.5 moles of O2. So now we were asked to calculate a quantity of mass instead of moles. That's no problem at all. That's no problem at all. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, can I just use this equation as is? Is, there some, is this equation currently, currently good to go? Is this equation usable right now? Yep, exactly right. So first thing we need to do is balance the equation. So I'm gonna do this uh, for us really quickly. So just doing some bookkeeping here, I have two hydrogens and one sulfur on the left. I have two oxygens on the left, and I have two hydrogens, one sulfur, and four oxygens. I notice my oxygen's unbalanced, and in order to get my four oxygens, I'm gonna multiply by two. So I'm gonna put a coefficient of two, two times two, in turn gives us four oxygens. So let's write our balance equation on the right-hand side. One common mistake I see students make is they, they get so excited to start solving the stoichiometry problem that they forget to check that the equation's balanced. Yep. And Haral, you're exactly right. We'll, we put a two in front of O2. Yep, perfect. So now that we have our balanced equation, let's put it in a box. And let's try to calculate the grams of hydrogen sulfide that are needed to completely react with 5.5 moles of O2. Okay, so starting off, let's make a solution map. What are we trying to calculate? What are we trying to calculate? What, what are we trying to report? in the end? What, what, what units will our answer have? Yep, so we want the grams of hydrogen sulfide. Okay, and what, what are we starting from? What are we starting from? What are we given? The moles of O2, exactly right. Now, what 
unit. What unit can we go through? That wh Where can we calculate grams from? What units do we typically calculate grams from? Moles, exactly right. The moles and moles of specifically of H2S. Okay, so now that I have my solution map, I'm going to put some labels to help me out. So to go from moles to grams, what conversion factor am I going to use? Ah, yes, someone already mentioned the molar mass. Exactly right. So to go from moles to grams, we're going to use our molar mass. More specifically, we're going to multiply by our molar mass. From moles to moles, what, can, what do we call the name of that conversion factor? How do we go from moles to moles in a chemical reaction? What do we call that conversion factor? What do we call the conversion factor to go from moles to moles? Molar ratio, yep. Also known as the formula, uh, oh yeah, um, is the stoichiometric ratio. Don't worry too much about the name, just know how to use it. Okay, now that I have my labels in place so that way I don't get confused, I'm gonna write out my starting units. I start out with 5.5 moles of O2. Okay, and what units are going to go on top? If we look at our arrow, what units are going to go on top? What units are we trying to get to in our first step? In our first arrow step, what units are going to go on top? Moles of H2S, exactly right. And what units are we going from? What units are going to go on the bottom? Yep, exactly right, moles of O2. Now let's read off from our chemical equation. How many moles of H2S are participating in the reaction? How many moles of H2S are participating? One, exactly right. And how many moles of O2 are participating? Two. Okay, perfect. Now for the next step. So we've, we've done our first conversion. Let's put a check. Now for our second conversion, we, we need to go from moles of H2S to grams. So what units are going to be on top? If we're going from moles to grams. What units are going to be on top? Grams, yep. So grams of H2S. And then what units are going to be on the bottom? Where are we going from? Moles of H2S, exactly right, exactly right. Now, this is the molar mass, so let's do that really quickly. So we're gonna add up the mass of sulfur, which is 32, and the mass of hydrogen, which is one times two, which gives us a molar mass of 34 gram per mole. Is everyone comfortable with that molar mass calculation? Does everyone understand where I got that number from? Where do we read these masses off from? Where do we get these masses from? Where am I, where am I pulling these numbers from? The periodic table, exactly right. Always make sure you bring your periodic table to lecture because you're always gonna have to use it for something. Okay, now let's take a look. Let's take a look at computing out this expression. So if we punch this into our calculator, so let's punch this into our calculator at home. We're gonna get 93.5 grams of H2S. And let's really watch our sig figs here. How many sig figs does our input have? How many sig figs does our number input have? Two, exactly right, it has two sig figs. So then our answer, we'll need to round it to two sig figs, so that gives us 94 grams of H2S. Exactly right. Okay, let's do another example. Let's talk about product generation. So we're asked to calculate how many grams of sulfuric acid are produced by complete reaction of 10 grams of H2S. Okay, 
This time we're doing a mass to mass conversion, but we can handle that. We can handle that. So what are we trying, what are we trying to calculate? In the end, what are we trying to calculate? What are we trying to calculate? What am I asking for in this problem? Yep, we want the grams of sulfuric acid. And what are we starting with? What are we starting with? What are we starting with? Yep, the grams of H2S, specifically 10 grams of H2S. Now, how do we relate these two masses? Do we have a way to relate the quantities of hydrogen sulfide and sulfuric acid? Do we have a relationship that we can use? And what units is that relationship? Is it a mass to mass relationship or is it a mole to mole relationship? So we have this chemical equation and fundamentally, what relationship does our chemical equation let us calculate? Does it let us go from mass to mass directly? Yep, I see multiple students referring to the fact that this chemical equation gives us a mole to mole conversion pathway. So then, if we want to use our chemical equation, what units do we need to convert this grams of H2S to? What units do we need to convert this grams of H2S to? What units do we need? Instead of grams, we want to report over here what? Instead of grams, what units do we need to use our chemical equation? And don't be shy to type in chat. Moles, yeah. So we're going to need the moles of H2S. OK, now if we want to calculate the grams of sulfuric acid, where are we going to get the grams of sulfuric acid from? What units will we calculate grams of sulfuric acid from? And don't be shy to type in chat. Yep. More specifically, the moles of sulfuric acid. OK, perfect. So we have our solution map. It's really, I really encourage you to make these solution maps. One, they're great for getting partial credit on exams. Two, they really help you avoid the kind of odd mistakes that often happen if you lose track of your units. So starting off, we have 10 grams of H2S. And if we wanna go from grams to moles, from grams to moles, so let's make a unit conversion factor. So if we're going from grams to moles, what units will be on top? Moles. So we have one mole of H2S. And if we're going from grams, what units will be on the bottom? Grams. Yep, exactly right. So the grams of H2S per mole, essentially what we're doing here is we're dividing by our molar mass. And we know previously, we've seen this before, that the molar mass of H2S is 34 grams per mole. Wonderful. Now let's get to the real meat of this problem. Let's get to the real meat of this problem now. Looking at our chemical equation, looking at our chemical equation, we are what units are we going to in this conversion factor? What units are we going to in our solution map? So our second arrow in light blue, what units are we trying to get to? Yep, exactly right. We're trying to get to the moles of sulfuric acid. Okay, and what units are we starting from? What units are we trying to get away from? Moles of H2S, exactly right. And now looking at our chemical equation, looking at our chemical equation, how many moles of sulfuric acid are produced? How many moles of sulfuric acid are produced? One, yep. And how many moles of hydrogen sulfide are consumed? How many moles of hydrogen sulfide are we using up? Also one. 
Okay, perfect. And now for our final step, for our final step, we're going from moles of sulfuric acid to grams of sulfuric acid. So what units do we need to have on top? Grams, yep. And what you, let me write this a little bit more neatly. And what units are we gonna have on the bottom? So we're going two grams from what unit? What units are we getting away from in our last conversion? Moles of sulfuric acid. Exactly right. Now just as a sidebar calculation, let's calculate the molar weight of sulfuric acid. So we have 32 for the sulfur plus hydrogen, which is one times two, plus oxygen, which is 16 times four. So if we add that together, we get a total of 98 gram per mole. Is everyone comfortable with calculating molar masses? As we get later on in this class, you're gonna to have to get pretty fast at calculating your molar masses in these problems. Does this setup make sense to everyone? Okay, so. All we have to do now is punch it into our calculator. So we have 10.0 divided by 34 times 98. And that in turn gives us 28.82 grams of sulfuric acid. And looking at our sig figs, we have three as our input. So we're gonna round our answer to three sig figs. So that gives us 28.8 grams of sulfuric acid. Does that make sense? Everyone comfortable with these calculations? What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna let you loose on the following problem. And I've balanced the equation for you because I really wanna test your capacity to do stoichiometry separately before I have you deal with an unbalanced equation and stoichiometry together. Um, but I'd like you to do the following mass to mass conversion. So first we have to calculate the grams of aluminum needed to react with 70 grams of chlorine. And like, I'd like you to tell me how many grams of aluminum chloride are produced by a complete reaction of 81 grams of aluminum. So take a few minutes and let's tackle A and B and you're more than welcome to send me questions. We'll take about three to four minutes. So we'll come together at about 2.08. And don't be shy to send me your answers privately in the meantime, and I'll be more than happy to give you some feedback. And again, I would highly recommend making a solution map. Fundamentally, we're just doing unit conversions with different units. Any questions so far? Or is everyone still just working through it? We'll come together in, in about two and a half minutes.
everyone's quiet. Any questions? Any proposals for for answers? I want to see a few student responses before I give my instructor solution for these questions. These are very similar to simple questions that you'd see on the exam or homework. Ah, I see a lot of reasonable responses for part A. Um, so let's talk through part A um, and let's talk about how to set up this problem. So we're trying to calculate, so we're given in this problem, we're trying to calculate the grams of aluminum. We are given in this problem that we're starting with 70.0 grams of chlorine. Okay, now fundamentally our chemical equation gives us a mole to mole relationship. So we're gonna convert to moles of chlorine and then using our chemical equation, we can figure out the moles of aluminum. Okay, perfect. We have our solution map. Let's now execute. So we have 70.0 grams of chlorine. Now, if we draw our arrow, for our unit conversion, what units will need to be on top in our unit conversion factor? What units are going to be on top after our first conversion? Yep, exactly right, moles of chlorine. Now what's really important to note, and when you're doing a mass mole conversion, you don't care about your stoichiometric coefficients. Your mass mole conversion for every one mole of chlorine, what units are we going to have on the bottom? What units are we going to have on the bottom? For every, so we have a given mass of chlorine per mole of chlorine. This is our molar mass. And we know if we take, if we calculate the molar mass of chlorine really quickly, so we have 35.5 times two, we get about 71.0 gram per mole. So when you're doing a mass to mole conversion, the molar mass is the mass per one mole of material. Okay, so we don't include our stoichiometric coefficients just yet. Now, when we move to do our mole to mole conversion, that is when we break out our stoichiometric coefficients. So what units are going to be on top in our unit conversion? What units are going to be on top? What moles are we going to have on top? Moles of aluminum, exactly right. And what units are going to be on the bottom? Moles of chlorine, exactly right. So then, reading off from our equation, how many moles of aluminum do we produce? Oh, sorry, whoops, whoops, wrong, circled the wrong thing. How many moles of aluminum are reacting in this equation? Two. And how many moles of chlorine are reacting in this equation? Three, exactly right. So your stoichiometric coefficients only come into play when you're doing your mole-to-mole -mole conversion, relating quantities of reactants to reactants. Okay, finally, we're gonna finish off this expression. So looking at our units, what units do we need on top for our last conversion? Yep, grams of aluminum. And what units are gonna be on the bottom? 
moles of aluminum. Okay, would someone like to tell me what is the molar mass of aluminum metal? Just looking at the periodic table. This one, it's not even a calculation. This one's pretty fast. Would someone like to tell me the molar mass of aluminum? Yep, yep, 26.98 that will round to about 27.0. Okay, now let's punch that into our calculators. So we have 70.0 times 1 over 71 times 2 over 3 times 27.0. And that in turn gives us 17.74 17 grams that we in turn round to three sig figs to give us 17.7 grams of aluminum. So a lot of the responses I've seen were perfectly correct. Okay, so, so far so good. Let's now look at the next example. Let's now look at the next portion. So we're asked to calculate the grams of aluminum chloride produced by complete reaction of 81 grams of aluminum. So then our target is grams of aluminum trichloride, oh, no, sorry, aluminum chloride, if we're following strict nomenclature rules, and we're starting off with the grams of aluminum. Okay. In order to relate the masses of our reactant and product, we're gonna use our chemical equation. And as a result, we have to do a mole to mole conversion. Now, we're starting off with 81 grams of aluminum. And we know from our unit conversion map, we're gonna need moles of aluminum on top and grams of aluminum on bottom. This is our molar mass of aluminum. So for every one mole of aluminum, we have 27.0 grams of aluminum. Now let's get to the really important part here. When we're doing our mole to mole conversion, how many moles of aluminum chloride do we have produced per mole of aluminum consumed? So let's fill in first our coefficient for the moles of aluminum chloride. How many moles of aluminum chloride are we making in this reaction? How many moles of aluminum chloride are we making? Two. Yep. And how many moles of aluminum are we consuming? How many moles of aluminum are we using up? Two. Exactly right. Okay. Finally, finally, we're gonna do a conversion from moles of aluminum chloride to grams. So we want grams of aluminum chloride on top and moles of aluminum chloride on bottom. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick sidebar calculation of the molar mass. So we're gonna take chlorine, which is 35.5, times three plus aluminum, which is 27.0. And let's add those up really quickly in our calculator. Would someone like to provide me, after calculation, the molar mass of aluminum chloride? Yep, 133.35, which will round to 133.4. Perfect. Now all we have to do is enter this into our calculator. So we have 81 divided by 27 times two over two times 133.4. And in turn, after we punch that into our calculator, we get a mass we get a mass of 400.2 that we in turn round to 4.0 times 10 to the second grams of aluminum chloride. 
Would someone like to comment as to why I had to write my number in scientific notation? Would someone like to comment as to why I had to write my number in awkward scientific notation? And this is an important consideration to avoid sig figs, exactly right. Our input has two sig figs, so our output should have two sig figs. Exactly right, exactly right. Okay, so we still have a few minutes, so let's do one more example. Let's do one more example. So this time, this is the type of question you'd see on an exam. I'm not just gonna give you the chemical equation straight up. I'm going to have you write and balance the chemical equation from words, okay? So let's do one together and then we'll take a break, a 10 minute break, then we'll resume this lecture in lab for about an hour and a half, just so that way we wrap up this chapter. Okay, so hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, decomposes to yield oxygen gas and liquid water. Okay, so hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, decomposes. So we're gonna draw an arrow. What's the formula of oxygen gas? What's the formula of oxygen gas? And this is important. You need to know your formulas of your elements. O2, exactly right. Okay, water is given, also known as dihydrogen monoxide. Okay, now taking a look at the equation, is this equation balanced? No, okay. So I'd like everyone just to take about a minute and try to balance and fill in the coefficients for A, B, and C. And you're more than welcome to submit me your uh, proposed balanced coefficients in, these, in this next minute to minute and a half. You really wanna be comfortable balancing equations quickly so that way you don't have to worry about them. Yep, Mariano, your proposed answer is completely correct. So I'll share it with the class. So this setup would really be helped. So we have two hydrogens and two oxygens on the left. We have two oxygens plus one. So we have a total of three oxygens and two hydrogens on the right. You can actually cheat and use half notation and put a coefficient of one half for O2. That in turn gives us one oxygen plus one oxygen, which gives us two oxygens on each side. You then multiply all of your coefficients by two, and that gives you the following balanced equation. Two H2O2 leads to O2 gas plus two H2O liquid. Whatever method works, I just like half notation because it's faster personally for me. But as long as you reach the balanced equation, then you're good to go to actually begin solving the rest of this problem. Okay. So let's keep going now and let's make our solution map. We're asked to calculate the moles of H2O produced when five moles of H2O2 decomposes. So we're start, we want to calculate the moles of water. And we're starting from the moles of hydrogen peroxide. So we write our initial units. Oops, give it one moment. Oh, one moment, one note reloaded. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so we're trying to calculate the moles of H2O liquid. And we are starting from, oops, we are starting from the moles of H2O2. So in terms of solving this problem, we start with our initial units, which is 5.00 moles of hydrogen peroxide. And if our goal is to calculate the moles of water, what units are going to need to be on top? What units are gonna to need to be on top in this unit conversion ratio? 
what units are going to need to be on top. What are we trying to calculate here? And don't be shy to, to type in chat. Moles of water, exactly right. And what units are we going from? Oh, more specifically, two moles of water, which we obtained from our chemical equation. Now, what units are we going from? What units are we going from? What units do we need on the bottom of this conversion factor? Moles of what? Moles of H2O2. And if we look at our chemical equation, how many moles of hydrogen peroxide? Two, exactly right. So moles of hydrogen peroxide cancels and we're left with 5.00 moles of water. Okay, so we've completed this example page. We'll resume on page 50 of the notes in lab. So we'll take a quick 10 minute break and we'll resume in lab at 233. So I'll be saving this recording.